Hi everyone, I'm Omar Ahmed Badami, CDB Class of 2021 and CEO of Brilliant. And today, I'd like to talk to you all a little bit about early and medieval Japan. We'll start off by discussing a bit about the geography of Japan, talking about how Japan originally came to be, and discussing a bit about the history of feudal Japan. So first, let's start with the geography of Japan. Japan is a country located in East Asia. Um, it's right next to Russia, North Korea, South Korea, and of course, China. Um, and it's bordered by multiple seas. It's a, as you can also see, it's thus a chain of islands, which are, again, in very close proximity to these other nations, but are separated by all of them by some amount of water. Japan is quite long. Um, as you can see on the lower, lower left, um, it stretches basically from Boston to Florida um, on the East Coast, or if you're on the West Coast, it stretches basically the whole length of California, which is pretty long. However, its land area is around 20 times uh, smaller than that of the United States, so it is quite small. So Japan has a number of large cities. Its modern-day capital is Tokyo, um, but it also has many other cities such as Sapporo, Kagoshima, Hiroshima, Kobe, etc. Um, and Japan is made up of four central islands, um, which you can see here. One of the major ones is Hokkaido, um, the other one is Kyushu, this one is Sikoku. Um, and all each of these islands is made up of very small prefectures, uh, which can be seen here. They're sort of like the United, the Japanese equivalent of United, uh, of the U.S.'s states of sorts. And there are very many of these located on each part of the main islands. Additionally, Japan has a very varied geography. So as we said before, it stretches basically the entire length of the East Coast. So it has multiple large mountain ranges, um, which you can see by the sort of beige, sandy portions of the graph on your left. Um, one of the most famous mountains in Japan is, of course, Mount Fuji, which is located in what's known as the Japanese Alps, which you can also see to the top right. However, Japan, again, does have many, many, many islands, over 35,000 of them. Um, and one such example of these is the Coral Islands, which stretch up past the Sea of Oksok, um, bordering Japan and Russia, and are actually contested by both countries, but that's a completely separate issue. Um, and these islands don't really look very mountainous. They look more sort of like hills, but also have beaches, etc. Um, and down here, for example, near... Tokyo and Shikoku, you'll have larger, say, sand beaches, etc. So the geography of Japan is quite varied. Due to this, um, Japan gets a number of interesting weather and uh, occurrences. One such example is volcanoes. So Japan is conveniently located on something called the Ring of Fire, which is basically a large area of the Pacific that looks sort of like a contorted ring, um, which contains the boundaries between the large Pacific plate and all sorts of other smaller geographical plates. Um, and basically, when those boundaries rub against each other, then the Earth essentially causes magma to bubble up, and that creates volcanoes. This also often creates earthquakes. And Japan, as you can see, is on the border between the Philippine, Asia, and Pacific plates. So it has a lot of volcanic activity, as can be seen by one of its active volcanoes, uh, Sakurajima, on the right. Japan also frequently gets earthquakes and tsunamis because of this. Um, so it is a very geologically active region of the world. Also, because Japan is so long, it does have a wide majority of seasons. Um, so it has, as you can see, you know, very pretty different types of colors for tree leaves. Um, you can see spring, fall, summer, and winter, all depicted in one area, which is very common. Um, and also, because of Japan's unique location, they also tend to get a lot of monster storms, uh, or typhoons, uh, which we will see play a very important historical role um, for in, in the history of feudal Japan. Uh, more on that later. So now, let's discuss a little bit about ancient Japan. And for us, we'll think about the period from 30,000 BC, which is a very long time ago, to 1100s AD, which is fairly more recent. So prehistoric Japan, um, or as we might call it, basically caveman era Japan, or a little bit after that, 
um, it was full of people working with stone implements, such as the ones on your right. And as you can see, they're very different types of stones. Some of these look redder, some are like golderish. Um, they're also different sized tools. Some of them are far larger, likely used for cruder implements, and some of the others are quite fine and nearly pointed. Um, and they used these in order to build and maintain stone huts, um, like the ones you see on your left. They're made of stone, wood, and sort of like a pseudo-concrete uh, spike type of thing. Um, and they also used to make interesting statues. Um, these, I believe, are called Doga statues. Um, and they... The art style of them isn't exactly very refined, as we might think of them today, um, but it does sort of show an early influence of art in Japanese culture, which we'll see continues throughout their history and evolves. So fast forward a pretty long while, um, and now we have the sort of start of Japanese culture. So one of the most important parts of Japanese culture at this time um, was Shinto, um, which as you can see on the left, um, is sort of a, basically a Japanese sort of faith or tradition that originated way back from these prehistoric times. And it has its own set of lore and history and mythology set up with it, such as the myth of Izanagi and Izanami, or the first people in a sense. Um, and however, this was sort of a standalone thing. Once China came into being and Japan and China began to have dialogues in around the 700s AD, um, a Japanese prince called Prince Shotoku, represented on the right, brought over Buddhist influences um, from China to Japan, which originally led to the spread of Buddhism in Japan. And you can see that very clearly through the art representation here of Prince Shotoku. So in contrast to the Shinto sort of like flowing robes, long hair style, etc., um, Prince Shotoku's representation over here looks very similar to a sort of um, Indian representations or Chinese representations of the Buddha and Buddha-like figures that one might see. Additionally, um, Prince Shotoku also brought over the Chinese system of writing, which, as we'll see, is extremely important because Japanese writing today has heavily derived from this. Um, and originally, Japanese texts were basically written in Chinese. Um, despite, of course, being pronounced differently being Japanese, they still used the exact same Chinese characters. So Chinese influences on Japan in around the 700s and 800s AD were extremely important um, in shaping uh, the sort of cultural grounding of modern day Japan. So fast forwarding a little bit to around the 800s through 1100s, and we come across something called the Heian period. Um, and this was characterized uh, by a development of the arts in, in Japan. So as we saw two slides ago, um, prehistoric Japan, which, you know, was in the early BC, late BCs and early ADs, was sort of, you know, very primitive art styles, as you can see here, um, and these later became more refined, um, through, say, the 700s with the, the picture of Prince Shotoku and the original characters, but then the Heian period really led to the development of Japanese culture and art as being standalone from Chinese and Korean, um, culture as seen at the time. So one of the most important things that happened during the Heian period was the development of kana, which you can see on the left. And this led to Japan coming up with sort of two different writing systems. One of these is called hiragana, and the other one is called katakana. Um, and kana is basically just like a broad overarching term for the writing system in Japan. And as you can see, these are quite different from each other. So hiragana sort of looks a little bit more like Chinese side of writing, as we can see, like in this slide over here, you know, it's they look very similar. Whereas katakana sort of seems more staccatoed, more side of abrupt, and both of these systems for writing are still used in combination in Japan today. Um, so this marked an important diversion point from China, um, or from Chinese culture in Japan, but also sort of again laid the groundwork for the modern kana and writing in Japan today. Another important thing that happened in the Heian period was the development of art. So the painting on your right is a part of the Tale of Genji, which is actually one of the world's first written stories. Um, this was basically a tale of court life 
um, during the Heian period, um, written by a member of the Heian court. And it included, it was not just, uh, most stories of the time were just orally told, but the tale of Genji was actually written down. And it was also illustrated, as seen on by the wood panels on the right. This also crucially led to the development of samurai, uh, which we will get into slightly more in a couple of slides. But after the Heian period, Japan sort of became more feudal. Um, and this feudal Japan lasted from around the 1100s to the 1600s. But first, in order to understand feudal Japan, we need to understand what feudalism is. So feudalism was a system both in Japan, but also mirrored somewhat in Europe, where military service for a lord or an emperor um, would lead to you basically getting rewarded. And you could get rewarded for your service and loyalty through, say, getting a parcel of land, through owning serfs, which were basically peasants, um, through getting a government post, and so on. And basically all of feudalism focused on service and loyalty leading to rewards. So it was a very sort of driven, do stuff for me and I'll do stuff for you sort of system. Um, and this led to a very fixed hierarchy. So at the top of Japanese feudalism, you had the emperor and the court nobility, but these guys were basically just figureheads. They didn't really end up doing a lot. Um, but who are they figureheads for, you might ask? Well, there were three other classes below them for called the shogunate, the daimyo, and the samurai. So the shogun was basically Japan's military leader, um, and he was the one who actually had all the power. The emperor in Japan was basically just there as a figurehead for the shogun and allowed him basically whatever he wanted to do. The daimyo served under the shogun as sort of regional lords, and they would rule over their own little castles, as you can see on the right, and we'll get into these a little bit more shortly. Um, and the, under the daimyo, or the daimyo had samurai serving under them. And the samurai, well, we'll talk about them a little bit more, but for now, we can just say that they were like the knights of Japan. Um, and the samurai ruled over their own little parcels of land under the daimyo, and on those parcels of land, the peasants would serve and, you know, work, um, you know, uh, farm, they would sell crops, etc. And then below the peasants came the craftsmen, the people who used the peasants to do uh, the peasants' um, materials and trade to do things. And then last but not, but actually least in the uh, feudal hierarchy of Japan came the merchants. Um, and merchants came at the lowest rank because they were not able to be self-sufficient. So Whereas peasants, for example, could actually farm things on their own, they don't need other people, merchants couldn't really do anything unless someone came to them with a thing to sell or a thing to buy, which is why merchants sort of ended up at the bottom. And now let's move on a little bit to um, a map of Japan at the time, and you'll notice some similarities between this map and the map that we saw way at the beginning of all of the Japanese provinces. Um, or as they're actually called now, prefectures. And this just shows how deeply rooted uh, modern-day Japan is in its history. So it's still maintained a very similar sort of state format in, that se in the sense that historical prefectures, are still many of them still stay today. Um, but remember also that the shogun ruled over all of this, just like the emperor. But in order to manage each of these little provinces or prefectures, the shogun would attach a daimyo to them. Uh, now, at times, um, the daimyo would become a little bit overpowerful, and as shogunates broke down, and the daimyo would basically become regional lords and control miniature armies and so on, and this becomes troublesome a bit later on, but we'll get to that. So first, let's discuss the samurai. Um, so samurai were essentially um, the Japanese version of uh, European medieval knights, um, they would, they were essentially the cavalry. Um, so as you can see, they wore plated armor um, on the right, um, and this is an actual samurai suit of armor. Um, sometimes it was reinforced with bamboo or a little bit of steel or chainmail, um, but basically it was just plated armor on top of each other. 
um, they would, of course, again, as they're the cavalry, most of the time you would see samurai riding horses, as you can see over here. And horses were actually imported to Japan. They didn't originate there. Um, also, one important thing about a samurai is their distinctive helmet. So, as you can see, the helmets um, sort of look a little bit like Darth Vader's, um, in the sense that they have that little branch at the end and the mask. And the interesting, the mask actually served two purposes. One was, of course, to protect the face, but the second one was normally samurai masks were painted over in a way that made them look a little bit like a, a Japanese devil of sorts um, in Shinto mythology. And that was intended to A, make the samurai look bigger than they originally were, and B, also make the enemy just get scared and weaken their resolve. Um, so again, as samurai served under and also lived with daimyos and their horses, and crucially, their two swords, um, then the samurai would, if a daimyo decided to go to war with another daimyo, well, the samurai would have to fight for that daimyo. And basically, it was, again, given that the feudal system was all about loyalty and obedience, the samurai just served whatever the daimyos wanted them to do. So, fast forwarding a tiny little bit, um, we, the Mongols uh, had, at this point, taken control of China, and they decided that they wanted to move on and attack Japan. So, there were two different Mongol attempts at uh, invading Japan, one in 1274 AD and one in 1281 AD. Um, and, again, remember that the geography of Japan is such that it's isolated from China, Korea, and Russia, and basically everywhere by bodies of water. So in order to attack Japan, the Mongols needed to make boats. So the Mongols put all of their soldiers on boats and crossed the sea, and they tried to get to Japan. That's where the problems occurred. Firstly, remember how before we talked about Japan having large storms, like the one below? Well, that caused a bit of problems for the Mongols, because given that they had the Mongols had to now deal with a, fearsome Japanese samurai, B, also deal with terrible weather. So, many of the Mongol ships both times got wrecked by these superstorms, or as the Japanese term, chose to term them, kamikaze storms. Um, and the remaining Mongols that remained on Japanese shores were quickly taken by the samurai. Um, so on the left you can see two samurai standing over a dead Mongol, and on the right you can see a very beautiful illustration of Mongol ships being sort of storm-tossed storm about in the waves um, uh, due to the kamikaze storm. So essentially, the Mongols never got to Japan. Would history have been different if they had? Probably. How? We may never know. But it's always something fun to speculate about. So fast-forwarding another couple hundred years, there was sort of a period of turbulent peace, if could be called that, um, during between the Mongol invasion period and what's now going to be called the Warring States period. And the Warring States period goes from 1467 to roughly around 1600. Now, this map of Japan, A, looks very similar to the prefectures, but also is crucially different. So each of these little flags that has a name written next to it represents basically a clan or a, basically a daimyo or mini shogun who wants to, who rules over that land. And at this time, everyone's goal was to take over the capital of Japan, which was Kyoto. And Kyoto is located somewhere within the middle-ish over here. Um, and as you can see, it's a very central location, but that's also where the emperor was. And remember, the emperor was the figurehead. So if they could get there and plant their own emperor instead of keeping the emperor that was currently there, they would have control essentially over all of Japan. So one guy on the top left, um, his name was Oda Nobunaga. And Oda Nobunaga, well, he controlled the Oda clan. And he was basically brilliant at tactics. He essentially steamrolled a path all the way to Kyoto with the help of two other guys here and here. So one of the, the first guy is Toyotomi Hideyoshi, um, and the second one is Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now their names were originally different, um, and the Japanese names during the Warring States period kind of tended to change a lot, so we're just going to stick with the name that they were last immortalized with of sorts. So, Oda, with the help of his two friends, and along with a bunch of 
uh, other allies that sort of ended up flip-flopping between betraying him and being with him. Essentially, all got destroyed except Oda Nobunaga. And he, with along with his two friends, essentially ended up taking a Kyoto, but also a bunch of other parts of Japan. So by this point, he had literally taken over uh, all, at least like the main island, plus a bit of the second one, and a little bit of Kyushu. So he, he was basically set. However, um, Oda Nobunaga died, which was kind of unfortunate, and Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who was originally supposed to go with Oda Nobunaga and was his quote-unquote friend, decided to sort of betray him, which was not fair. So then, this other guy, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who was originally allied with Nobunaga, um, decided to sort of step up for Nobunaga's legacy and decided to go against Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Of course, Tokugawa Ieyasu won, Hideyoshi lost, um, and then... Basically, Tokugawa Ieyasu was like, okay, well, no one's really going to do anything against me now, so it's time that I set up my own dynasty. And this led to the creation of the Edo or Tokugawa period. Um, and on the right, you can see a statue of Tokugawa Ieyasu, um, or the founder of the Tokugawa period, the Tokugawa dynasty. Um, now, you might be wondering why this is called the Edo period, because Edo is not really part of the word Tokugawa. So, crucially, um, Tokugawa Ieyasu decided to move the capital of Japan as sort of a power move from the traditional capital of Kyoto, down here, all the way up to modern-day Tokyo, which was originally called Edo. And this scared people a little bit, because one, this showed how powerful he was by simply overturning years and decades, centuries of precedent of having the capital in Kyoto, but b, also helped to consolidate his power more, because Kyoto isn't exactly in the center of the Tokugawa Empire, whereas Tokyo pretty much is. Um, so, the re also, the Tokugawa Empire looks a little bit small right now, um, but in reality, the influence of the Tokugawa Empire stretched up all the way pretty close to Hokkaido and pretty close back down to Kyushu. However, these regions are not shown on the map because they were still heavily contested, um, and the states at the time were still in periods of infighting. But the Tokugawa Empire and the Tokugawa period is basically a period of unity in Japan, and this lasted for around 268 to 265 years, um, depending on which way you look at it, until the Meiji era. And we will talk more about the impact of the Tokugawa period and what happened next, next time. So to summarize what we talked about today, um, we learned that Japan is extremely geologically diverse, it's got mountains, it has volcanoes, it's got earthquakes, it has very, very scary big storms. Um, we also learned how much Chinese influences, such as language, uh, writing, and Buddhism, played a key role in early Japanese society um, right after the prehistoric era. Um, this also, afterwards, we talked about the Heian period, um, which led to the development of the two writing systems in Japan. Um, and how it led to the development of Japanese art, and crucially, samurai, um, which played a key role in Japanese feudalism. Um, and samurai also played a very key role in the Warring States period because they acted as soldiers on the ground for big daimyos and shoguns like Oda Nobunaga and Tokugawa Ieyasu. And after Tokugawa Ieyasu essentially got rid of all of his political rivals, or as they died before he, then this leads to the creation of the Tokugawa era, which we will discuss more next time. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next lecture.